Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for listening. Now, this is the part of the podcast introduction where usually I appeal to the better nature of you listeners and uh, ask for your help in supporting the show. And while that's important, and we always appreciate it, and you can go to jeffersonhour.com and click on donate to find out how, I'm not going to go there this week. Instead, I want to talk about Lindsay Chervinsky. She was on the show this week, a delightful 10 Things episode about Theodore Roosevelt. But prior to us talking about Roosevelt, she informed Clay and I that she had been the victim of a renegade scooter and in fact broke her foot. She also said that she gets amazing email from you Jefferson Hour listeners. So I'm going to propose those of you out there who can send a note to Lindsay wishing her a speedy recovery. She's got a pretty good attitude about it. And I'll quit with that and let you take over, sir. Well, people can do that by going to her website uh, and there's a contact uh, basis there for her. She's terrific. Uh, she was great fun today. Of course, we're talking about one of the happiest subjects around, Theodore Roosevelt, who was just this gigantic figure. And, you know, we didn't have time during the program, David, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about the documentary film we made about him. So I'm working to help digitize all of Roosevelt's materials, and one of them is a film that we found in the Library of Congress, which is called Through the Roosevelt Country with Roosevelt. And it's a film made just a few months after his death in 1919, by a man named Herman Hagedorn, who also wrote several important books about Roosevelt. And he came out to the Badlands of North Dakota with a film crew, a Pathé film crew, and a Bell and Howell uh, camera. And he made the first uh, commemorative documentary about Roosevelt in the Badlands. And we had it digitized. Um, And then I showed it to you. And I said, we should do something with this. And you produced this notion and just explain what it is we did. We could get pretty deep into that. But, um, you know, I got to I got really curious about what kind of conditions they would have filmed in, you know, and how did they do this and who shot it? And and then and then what kind of a camera would have been available? Well, we found some photographs. We were able to identify the camera. Um, Without, again, going into all the detail, I found a gentleman who lived in Washington State, and his name was Sam Dodge, an award-winning cameraman. I think he did, like, music videos for Michael Jackson at one point. Anyway, he he, he had retired, and he had spent his time collecting old cameras and um, repairing them and selling them and shooting them. So it was a real meager budget, if, if you recall. And we devoted a great portion of that budget into flying Sam Dodge out with his camera, buying film stock that would work. And then he we replicated scenes from the original Hagedorn movie um, and kind of put them up side by side. It was great, great, great fun. And and a sidebar, that camera got sold after the movie. Do you know this? I did not know this. It was sold. Do you know who bought it? No. Martin Scorsese. Holy smokes. So we yeah. we have the cameraman. We have an identical camera. We managed to find film. Then the next step was, where was the original Hagedorn film shot? And you and I yeah. scoured the Badlands, and we had some notions, and we actually found the place where one of the key scenes had been filmed, and we found sort of the right place to set up the tripod. So now we have the original and we have the antique camera, which we're using to film it again. This was a long time ago, like 10 years. How we have long? your high-definition video camera, so they're all there shooting the scene. And we juxtapose all of this and have commentary. Uh, it was an amazing thing. And it was really, really fun. Funded by the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University. And so then we showed it to the annual meeting of the Theodore Roosevelt Association that came out to the Badlands that year. And so they were watching. They had never seen this film before, the original. And we, then they saw our black and white uh, repeat footage. And they saw our color uh, v- uh, documentary about the documentary. Um, if people write to us, we can find copies to make available to people. It was an extraordinary Actually, thing. I believe that is online. And if it is, 
I will put a link up on the web page. Yeah, let's post it, David, because I would love for people to see it. It was great fun. It was such fun, and I remember that he came out, Sam, um, and he had long silver ponytail, and we were up on the bluff overlooking the village of Medoran. I'll move the camera, no, another two feet this way, that way, which is the right lens. And, of course, we had no idea whether this would work, but when the film was processed and came back, it was spectacular. And then just one more thing about this. The Dakota Prairie Grasslands, which is a unit of the National Grasslands under the USDA, uh, was interested in the film because they wanted to look at the difference in the grass and the foliage and the juniper bushes and so on between 1919 and today, and so they used it to try to evaluate how the, the the flora of the lands of the badlands of Western North Dakota have been changed through human activity, through grazing, uh, from 1919 until uh, the second decade of the 21st century. So the film had a number of extraordinary uses that we could not have predicted, and it's fun just to see. It was the first reunion of the Rooseveltians, so Joe Ferris was there. Sylvain Ferris was there, William Merrifield was there, um, Margaret Roberts was there. All these cronies and friends of his from that period gathered for what amounted to a Roosevelt reunion in the Badlands. And Hagedorn was bringing, at this time, 1919, David, uh, film had been around for a while, but it was still a pretty new medium, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I just verified it is up online. We will put a link on our website so people can take a look at it. It, it was real fun to do. I've forgotten. I, I might have to watch it again myself. It was really fun to do. And anyway, so people can go there. Books. If people want to read more about Roosevelt, Hagedorn has a book called Roosevelt in the Badlands. Um, a really good biography is by H.W. Brands called The Last Romantic. Edmund Morris has a three-volume magnum opus on Roosevelt, the first of which, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a magnificent biography of Roosevelt. And if you want to read one of the best presidential autobiographies that we have, you can read Roosevelt's, which was published in 1913. Very good. And with that, shall we go to this week's show, sir? Yes, I want to thank everyone for this, for watching, for listening, for coming to our site, for contributing to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Uh, as you know, we're kind of changing, moving towards listening to America. We ask everyone to stay with us and to tell their friends, and we look for great new things. Joe Ellis has and I were in contact earlier, and he says, hey, don't forget about me. I called him to congratulate him on his role in the Ken Burns um, documentary about Benjamin Franklin. Well, you know, I was hoping that we could get the two of you together and maybe uh, have have a little chat about that. He's willing, so let's let's line that up because Joe misses us, and— he has a new Labradoodle, by the way, that he's eager to tell you about. Let's go to this week's show. Thanks, everyone. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, another of our 10 Things episodes, and the subject is Theodore Roosevelt. I'm your host, David Swenson. We're joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and also our returning friend and historical expert and author and many other things, Lindsay Chervinsky. And Lindsay, we're so glad to have you back. We so appreciate you contributing to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Oh, it's my pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. I was pretty interested when I got the email from the both of you that this week we were going to talk about Theodore Roosevelt. I believe Clay has started a fan club for this gentleman. Am I right? Not a fan club, but we're digitizing all of Roosevelt's papers. So I had an idea out in the Badlands that we should create a digital Roosevelt Archive, and, and in doing so, create the first comprehensive digital presidential library. And I talked some people into wanting to do this, and we're doing it out at Dickinson State University in Western North Dakota. We have about a million images, a million, a million pages of scan, and we've processed about 80,000 documents. And a document could be a photograph, a cartoon, a newspaper clipping, a letter in, a letter out, a book, um, a, a presidential address. Uh, a piece of film, there are a few, um, and or a piece of audio, there are a few. And so a document can be many different things, and a document has to have something called metadata. So we've processed about 80,000 of these documents. Some are half a page in length, and some are 300 pages in length, and, and, and no other president has a comprehensive digital library. Lincoln has something of one. John Kennedy is sort of halfway there. They spent tens of millions of dollars, and then they ran out of money 
Today, most presidential records are electronic, and they're infinite in number. Jefferson had 26,000 letters. Uh, it could easily be digitized, has not been transcribed yet fully. But Roosevelt wrote 155,000 letters and 40 books. Uh, he's one of the writingest presidents, may be the writingest president, and so we're uh, digitizing. We're not fans. Uh, we're, we're scholars. I have learned so much about T.R. over the years from you, and I know your knowledge of him is is really extensive. And that was one of the points was that you, you had said he was the writingest president. He was also possibly the readingest president, wasn't he? There are three possibilities on the readingest. One is our man, Thomas Jefferson. But I don't think he wins this battle. I think he comes in third, actually. I'd say the second reading as president is John Adams, who read, you know, five times, I think, as much as Jefferson did, at least during the retirement years. But I think Roosevelt is probably indeed the reading as president. He read a book a day for some sections of his life, so just try that for a month. And he had something close to a photographic memory. And then he wrote incessantly, not just 155,000 letters, but depending on how you count 30 or 40 books, he's the he has more books than any other president. The second is Jimmy Carter, and if he lives another 100 years, he'll catch up. And the third is John Quincy Adams. I was going to ask where John Quincy Adams fell in that readingist. He's uh, right up there. Do you think he read more than his father or less? I think less. I think he read less. He lived for such a long time. I do wonder how that sort of factors in because he continued to read and read and read. And he loved reading things like poetry. He was a huge fan of the more sort of genteel arts, not just... He wanted to be a poet and his mother, Abigail, said, "Uh uh-uh, you are the son of one of the most important men and you must have a life that's equal to the expectations of your birth. It was probably a good choice, don't you think? Well, unless you care about his happiness. (laughs) I'm not sure he always cared about his happiness. We digress. Before we start, uh, I I would like to point out that that we're we're talking about Theodore Roosevelt this week at uh, the suggestion of one of our listeners. And also, before we start, to the two of you, what should our listeners know about Roosevelt? He was the 26th president of the United States, an accidental president. He became president through the back door when William McKinley was assassinated in September of 1901. Roosevelt comes exactly 100 years after Thomas Jefferson. They occupy side-by-side space on Mount Rushmore, and it's hard to think of two individuals who happen to be the president of the United States who could be more completely different. I'm really glad we're doing an episode on Roosevelt, and I know we're excited about the possibility of, of course, we will never abandon the early republic, but branching out a little bit to include very fascinating characters. And I'm not sure there's a more fascinating character than TR. I often get asked, who's your favorite president? And I say, well, that's a complicated question. Who, who is, I think, the best president is usually Washington and Lincoln. Who's the most interesting president? And Roosevelt naturally comes to mind because he is such a fun, it is impossible to be bored while you are learning about Theodore Roosevelt. It is impossible to be bored while you're talking about Theodore Roosevelt because he had so many interests and so many passions and was so full of life and extraordinary exuberance in all things, sometimes to his detriment. And sometimes he took all of his ideas a little bit too far. But I would say that as, you know, as as the presidency goes, we owe a lot of our modern conception of progressivism to Roosevelt. He, of course, stood on the shoulders of many great journalists and other activists, but he made so many of the things of our modern life a reality, including labor restrictions, food restrictions, making sure factories where food was produced were not disgusting so that you weren't eating things that we really shouldn't be eating. He cared greatly about preservation and conservation and um, the plight of children laborers and female laborers. And so, so much of our of our modern life, we owe to this conception of progressivism that he embraced and ran with. Now, let me just say this, David, to follow up what Lindsay said about how delightful he is in so many ways. I had the chance to meet Conan O'Brien in New York City at a National Theodore Roosevelt Association banquet. He was the banquet speaker. And there were like 300 lovers of Theodore Roosevelt in the audience. And Conan was fantastic. And he loves Roosevelt. He said, here's the thing about Roosevelt. Whenever you mention his name, people smile. 
He said, that's not true of Calvin Coolidge or Herbert Hoover or Lyndon Johnson or even JFK. The, the president you always smile when that name comes up is Theodore Roosevelt. Now, just to anticipate, David, that should not blind us to the fact that he was a jingoist, an imperialist, that he was, he could be arguably be called a racist, uh, particularly with respect to Native Americans, but not just Native Americans. He he flirted a little with the eugenics movement as, as a boy. He was a bully in every sense of the term. We say bully as one of his famous statements, but he was a that, bully. That, that all may be true, Clay, but let's not start. I'm just saying, <laughs> let's work our we way. We smile, up to but it. we have to remember that we that there is another part of him that's that's very important for us to think about. Agreed. But let's start with how interesting he was and perhaps go to one of your first points and, and you can tell me why you chose it. And that is this famous scene of T.R. and Pinchot boxing and wrestling when they first met in Albany, New York. It goes to Lindsay's point that he's just so crazy that he's the governor of New York. He, he was the hero of the of the San Juan Hill in Cuba in 1898. He swept into the governorship. He occupies, I think it's a carefully chosen term, occupies the governor's mansion in Albany. And Gifford Pinchot, who is a very tall, quite reserved, highly educated aristocrat, comes to talk with this governor that he's never met about conservation issues. And he said, this is Pinchot's account. He said, as I came up to the mansion, I saw the governor of New York lowering his children down through from the upper story windows on ropes because there was an Indian attack and they were playing cowboys and Indians, the governor, through windows. Then he said, we had luncheon. And after luncheon, Roosevelt said, hey, you want to wrestle? And they go down in the basement and they wrestle. I mean, here, think of Ronald Reagan wrestling with John Stockman or something. They go down in the basement and they wrestle and then they box. And so you think, what kind of era was this? Pinchot, the fact that Pinchot was willing to do this is a monument to him, but... When you think of Rosa, you just think he's sort of like a grown-up child with infinite energy and nothing nothing is beneath his joy. The three of us are doing this on Zoom so we can see one another. And I really wish our listeners could have seen Lindsay's face <laughs> as you talked about them wrestling. Well, there was no I, snark. It was all smile. Book. It, it was. He continues these these exploits once he's in the White House. He has two favorite cabinet secretaries, according to his children. And one of them was Philander Knox, who was his attorney general. And they used to go racing in Rock Creek Park. They would they were Roosevelt was an avowed horseman. He said the Roosevelts were horse people. They were not car people, they were horse people. And they used to go racing and have competitions to see who could jump over higher stuff, whose horse could, you know, uh, accomplish greater heights, which I'm sure the secret, well, there weren't secret service, but I'm sure his protective detail, he did have some protective guards loved that activity. Uh, but again, I mean, to, to your point, which president goes on these racing competitions with their attorney general? There's a book that I know that you're familiar with, Clay, um, The Big Burn by Timothy Egan. And, and he writes, these two Easterners, born into wealth, who crusaded a century for the progressive era idea that a democracy and public land were inextricably linked, they always talked about land belonging to, quote, the little guy. It was a radical idea then at a time when the gulf between the rich and the poor was never greater. Roosevelt and Pinchot were both traitors to their class in that sense, and both were, how to say this, odd people. So important. This is one of the handful of greatest things about Theodore Roosevelt. He had seen in Europe that the, the most beautiful places were locked up, owned by the wealthy. So Roosevelt feared that our national parks, monuments, etc., were going to be gobbled up by the rich and turned into playgrounds for the privileged. And he did not want that. He wanted the democracy of our open country. And he insisted that average human beings could go out there and squat around a fire and eat camp beans and drink camp coffee and listen to coyotes. And he did not want this kind of effect, that the Aspen effect or the Jackson Hole effect, which we have in some places. And Roosevelt did more to keep the public lands secure, conserved, and open to the public of America than any other individual. And I once had the chance to ask the great Charles Wilkinson of the University of Colorado Law School, can Roosevelt's conservation achievement be exaggerated? He said no. 
you cannot exaggerate the importance of Roosevelt in the history of conservation in the United States. So if he had done nothing else, he set aside 230 million acres of the public lands as national park, national forest, national wildlife refuge, which he invented, national game preserve, national monument. Nobody did what Roosevelt did. Very good. We need to take a short break. When we come back, I may veer from this list a little bit, but um, I'm, I'm excited to hear both of you comment more on Theodore Roosevelt. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour this week, a 10 things episode about Theodore Roosevelt. And the two of you have given me a list of points that you wanted to go through, but I want to veer from that just a little bit because Clay, you and I know so much about Roosevelt's time in Dakota and it's not on the list. And I really think listeners should hear some of, you know, his struggle with his health and why he came out here and his, his way to heal himself. I just think that's such a fascinating story. So would you indulge me? I will, if you will tell the story of the documentary film we made. But first, let me just say this. He came here in 1883. He came here to kill a buffalo. He wanted to kill a buffalo before it was too late. Everybody assumed that the buffalo was going to become extinct. Roosevelt felt that it was the buffalo was America's greatest quadruped. He came out, he got his buffalo. He fell in love with the badlands of Western Dakota Territory. He impulsively invested in a ranch. He lost a lot of money over the course of five years, but he said it was the greatest investment of his life. He came out scrawny, underweight. He had digestive issues. Um, he had had almost crippling asthma as a child, and he was transformed by his sojourn on the American frontier, and he wrote beautifully about it, and he later said and meant that he would never have been the president of the United States were it not for his time uh, in western North Dakota. He uh, arrested boat thieves and, and marched them to justice through impossible weather conditions. He punched out a drunken gunslinger in a bar on the Montana line. He was knocked off horses and broke his shoulder bones and so on. Uh, he had almost had a duel, or he thought he almost had a duel, with the famous French aristocrat, the Marquis de Morez, and on and on and on. And the stories are magnificent. That's why I got interested in Roosevelt. I moved back to North Dakota 19 years ago, and I wanted to take on a project that would make me wander in the Badlands, and I've done a lot of that wandering with none other than the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. So please, well, let's not get too far off topic, but you did walk the Little Missouri solo. Twice. Yes, which is, is really something. Insane. But you got you got to tell the Valentine's Day story, please. Roosevelt married a woman named Alice Hathaway Lee. He sort of worshipped her. She was strong and athletic and beautiful. He was a, the youngest assemblyman of the New York State Assembly. Um, he said, I rose like a rocket. She got pregnant. They lived in New York. Pregnancy was going pretty well. Uh, he had to leave to go back up to Albany. On the 12th of February, 1884, his wife Alice gave birth to a young daughter, um, the younger Alice, the famous Alice. Uh, he got telegrams of congratulations. A second telegram came saying that his wife, Alice, had taken a terrible turn for the worse. He must come back immediately. He rode the train. To, it was fog. It took five hours. He got to Manhattan and came to the door of, of their brown house, and his brother, Elliot, answered the door. And Elliot said, Theodore, there is a curse on this house. Mother is dying, and Alice is dying too. So on Valentine's Day, 1884, Roosevelt's mother, Mitty, age 49, died of typhus. He was with her when she died, and a few hours later, he was holding his wife Alice in his arms when she died of Bright's disease, a total collapse of her kidney function. And so the two most important women in Roosevelt's life died simultaneously on Valentine's Day, 1884. He had a two-by-three-inch pocket diary, uh, now a famous document in which he made a large X, and then wrote, the light has gone out of my life, and believed that his life, for all practical purposes, was essentially over. He did recover, of course, partly in the Badlands, uh, and he uh, went on to marry his childhood sweetheart, Edith Caro, who turned out to be a, a perfect wife for Theodore Roosevelt. So, Lindsay, uh, you've heard that story a thousand times, of course. I have. You know, I think Roosevelt's relationship with women is fascinating because he didn't particularly believe in equality. 
he liked a certain form of femininity and thought that women's place was really in the home. I think his initial relationship with Alice demonstrated his thoughts about sort of keeping wives at bay, um, and at least at an arm's length from politics and from intellectual thought. But Edith was quite bright and thoughtful and intellectual and was much more of his equal in, in that regard. And while she was certainly a dutiful wife and um, a very loving mother, she also, I think, balanced him a bit more. But, you know, it's always with these characters, it's always, I think, one of the best ways to have an understanding of who they are and their strengths and their weaknesses is through their relationship with their partners. And he's no exception because that relationship is quite revealing. Well, just let me say to that a uh, couple of quick things, Lindsay. One is that he did uh, become a suffrage believer in 1912 during the Bull Moose campaign, and he received the first Electoral College vote cast by a woman, by Jane Addams, uh, who reluctantly voted for him. She hated his warmongering and his big game hunting and his cult of masculinity and all of that, but she also loved his reformist agenda, some of which you had outlined earlier in the program. And I should say, too, that it, his senior thesis at Harvard was on women's rights, uh, and he said a woman should be able to do anything that a man does if she can hack it. That is such an extraordinarily uh, Theodore Roosevelt statement. Maybe as our part two, we should do a segment on Alice, the second Alice. Of, because of crazy Alice's she, daughter. She was Theodore Roosevelt in a woman's body. And she is just as interesting as her father and gives can go punch for punch. Let me say to that, I do think we should do that because of the constriction on what a woman could do, especially at their level of social status. She could not find a life's purpose. She had her father's brain, his drive, his will, his command, but she there was nothing she could do. She couldn't she could be a nurse maybe, but that would be probably beneath her social status. She was in a in a straitjacket as a human being and we lost the talent of one of the great women of the 20th century and she became bitter in some respects. The fact that women were not really allowed until about your birth time, Lindsay, to, to think of anything that they might want to do and be able to do it is an astonishing fact of the, of the slow social history of the United States. Makes me very, very grateful that I live when I do because I would not have done well back then. You know, one of your points, Clay, and this would be a good time to bring it up, was that uh, Roosevelt, you say, wrote surprisingly tender and romantic letters to his wife, Edith, long into their marriage. It's amazing. You know, we were digitizing all of Roosevelt's papers. Now, they, Edith burned most of the letters between them after his death. She was an exceedingly private person uh, and in some ways a stern person, but a great judge of character, better than her husband. And she, as, as Lindsay rightly says, balanced out his more boyish exuberance. Uh, and by the way, as First Lady, she essentially established the White House as a Performing Arts Center, uh, in a sense, anticipating the National Endowment for the Arts that was created in 1965 by Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but she loved Roosevelt. She also understood that you can't control Roosevelt, that you have to give him enough leeway to be Theodore Roosevelt. But he wrote her these letters when they first got together and then throughout their long and extraordinary marriage which were love letters that the kind you would see a late adolescent writing. And you know, he talked about how beautiful she was and that she was her figure was better now than it was when they first met. And, and she still had the, the, the blush of, of a youthful beauty in her cheeks. And, and some of the letters are romantic to the point of almost being a little racy. And you think, well, this guy, this man's man, who's always beating somebody up, was able to be greatly tender when he felt like it. And he certainly felt that he could be tender with respect to his wife, Edith. He wasn't particularly tender to his children, and especially not to Alice, his daughter. But there is a soft side to Roosevelt. He loved poetry. No president, including John Quincy Adams, quotes books more often than Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he loved literature. He memorized whole swaths of it. He had a really tender soul, and he was sort of, I would say, Lindsay, I want your, I want your commentary on this, please. I think that he was a, a tender soul trapped in a zeitgeist, this kind of fear 
as we urbanized and, and floods of immigrants were coming and the frontier was closing, there was a national anxiety about virility and manhood and, 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 and the American character and, and huge overcompensation. And Roosevelt was right in the center of that anxiety. I think that's absolutely right. I think both in terms of his conception of masculinity and what it meant to be a man, and a lot of that came from his father, who was incredibly stern and had been a huge domineering political figure. And so Roosevelt so desperately wanted his approval and his affection. And the way to do that was to be a man's man. So it was not to accept that you have asthma, but to, to fight it and to battle it, to not accept weakness, to push through, to be successful. But there had also been a deeply ingrained concept in the American identity that Western lands, the, the borderlands, were essential because it was really important for people to have a place to go, for men to have their own land, to care for their families, what, what used to be called the frontier, although that is a deeply problematic term. And Roosevelt grew up with that knowledge, grew up with the importance of this concept. And as he was coming into adulthood, the concept of empty space, of an empty West, was disappearing because of the growth of the American people, white the white American people. And there was a real concern if, if this land evaporated, if this pressure valve went away, if the opportunity to prove oneself out West no longer existed, then what would become of the nation? Would it become the effeminate, um, corrupt, weakened empire that they saw in Europe? And so it was essential that the nation have an opportunity to prove oneself and to battle against things. And I think it's no accident that one of Roosevelt's idols was Abraham Lincoln. He thought that this moment of crisis had produced a generation of leaders. And so he was kind of always looking for a crisis himself to prove himself against because he wanted to prove that he could match up to it. And if I may, I would like to quote my very favorite thing that he ever wrote or said, because I think it so embodies who he was as a person, and also perhaps what is most admirable about his character. This is from the man in the arena speech. And he says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. The Sorbonne in 1910. So, Lindsay, I've seen innumerable CEOs, male CEOs, offices where that quote is in calligraphy or on the wall in some way. Do you do you feel that? Do you do you subscribe to the the person in the arena of dust and sweat and blood. So I'm not a CEO and you can't see it as as David mentioned we're on Zoom, but in my office I have a a a piece of art that has that quote because I think it is it is the right kind of inspiration. It's not saying that you have to be perfect or you have to achieve great things. It's that you have to try. You have to do something and maybe the thing that you're going to do is not the right thing that's better than doing nothing. And I find that to be as someone who sort of battles perfectionism, and I think he did too, I find that sentiment to be the right one to strive for. It's so interesting, Lindsay. I just want to stick with this for a moment, if I can, David, because you know we're living in this extraordinary time where I feel, and I think you both feel, that our republic is in some uh, fragility. Dire straits. And so, as you know, many academics uh, sit on the periphery and wring their hands and say righteous things and and uh, and lament. Uh, but I think I sense in you uh, an unwillingness to stand on the sidelines while this all happens. And so can you just say a little bit about your own strategy? You want to be a rigorous historian. You want to be fair-minded. You don't want to just be a bloviator. 
And yet, this is a time when, for all that you have studied about the American Republic, we're in some significant trouble here. We are. And I'm not arrogant enough to think that, you know, my writing or my work will necessarily change the world. But I think that these moments require one person at a time. And if I can take my understanding and my knowledge of what has come before and help people contextualize where we are now and understand how we got there, maybe how we've gotten through it in the past or what is different and new and, and therefore potentially a new type of danger, that is useful, that is helpful. And um, maybe it provides courage, maybe it provides consolation, maybe it provides inspiration, but I certainly am trying and I see my efforts as trying to to reach people who maybe would not have access to the more academic work and reach people where they are. So whether that's on social media, whether that's through a podcast, whether that's, you know, in op-eds or my newsletter, it's it's an effort to try and meet people where they're at, answer questions and be accessible. Last question along this line. Have you ever punched out anyone in a tavern? <laughs> um, no, but I did tell someone at a wedding that I have heard everything they stood for. So I think Whoa. that's about as close as I can get while maintaining my ladylike standards. I hope it was the bride or the groom. <laughs> no. Oh, good for that. I'm glad. Goodness. You know, so often in these conversations, the two of you know so much um, about all these historical figures, and I get to sit here and absorb it all, and I, I enjoy it so much. But in the case of Roosevelt, I mean, I look at Roosevelt as, you know, this wimpy, sick kid who fought through everything, and I'm not sure that people know that backstory. And in, in the minute or two we have left in this segment, can you enlighten folks? He had asthma, and it was, you know, today we can treat asthma, uh, still a terrible thing, but then it was really a grim problem, and he was suffocating. You know, asthma can make you suffocate. And he was around eight or nine years old, and he had been such a uh, an invalid that his he had kind of ruined the family summer. Uh, and his father, who was a very strong man and a stern man, uh, took him aside and said, Theodore. Your mind is strong, but your body is weak. You will never reach your potential if your body lags behind your spirit. Uh, I'm going to challenge you today. You, you must make your body. And Roosevelt said he looked up at his father, whom he worshipped. He said, I will, Papa. I will make my body. And his father brought him a home gymnasium kit, and he began to box and to do jumping jacks and sit-ups and push-ups. And, and it really is the case. I mean, this is a tremendously inspiring story that, you know, people— uh, are born with maladies or um, you know, suffer from debilities or weaknesses. We all do. Uh, and Roosevelt decided by Godfrey he was going to overcome this, and he did by sheer discipline. And, you know, he, you know this, David, when he was out in the Badlands, they went on this buffalo hunt and everything went wrong that could go wrong. And he wound up one morning in a pool of five inches of water. And his guide, Joe Ferris, thought, well, finally he'll quit, you know. We'll drive this dude back to New York. The misery for both of them was through the roof. And Roosevelt sat up in this pool of water. You, you and I have both been there, David. And he said, he looked around. And he said, by Godfrey, but this is fun. <laughs> and that was Roosevelt's way of handling pain, that it was he, he, he embraced it. And he, and, and he decided he was going to embrace, move into the pain. And he overcame it and became one of the most extraordinary men of American history by sheer force of will at a time when there weren't medicines to really make that possible. And you, you can't, you know, I want Lindsay to talk about this when we come back from the break, but you can't hear that story and not feel a tremendous level of respect for Theodore Roosevelt because he could easily have been one of those sedentary New Yorkers who hung out at men's clubs and smoked cigars and read newspapers and, 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 and blamed the world for all of its woes. He chose to be a man in the arena in every sense of the term. Thanks for that. We do need to take a short break, but we'll be back to continue this conversation, 10 Things About Theodore Roosevelt, in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. 
our 10 Things conversation about Theodore Roosevelt with Clay Jenkinson and Lindsay Chervinsky. And I want to give Lindsay a chance to respond to, to what you were just talking about and Roosevelt's character. But I also have, you know, I'm a North Dakotan and, and I love this part of the world. And I regard the Badlands of North Dakota, in particular, the area of the Elkhorn Ranch as magic. And that's where Roosevelt went to heal himself. And I can easily get over romantic about this, so stop me if I do. But it's easy to understand why Western North Dakotans in particular have sort of grabbed onto this larger than life figure. And Lindsay, if you were to come to North Dakota, Roosevelt is everywhere in Western North Dakota. So having said that, and my love for the Badlands, do you want to respond to what Clay just said? Well, I do, you know, and I think your your love of Badlands is actually a good place to tie these things in because he did have such an indomitable spirit. And I think the wilderness of North Dakota is in some ways a really good representation of that because he just kept, he could not be conquered. And in fact, when he died, his children and his family basically said that he he lived too much for his heart to continue. He just had lived such an exuberant life that he had outlived his organs. And, you know, I, I have not been to North Dakota. It's one of my states not yet crossed off on my map. But I think that the time will absolutely come where that's a requirement because, as you probably well know, there is now a new site uh, that is designed to commemorate Theodore Roosevelt. And he is the only president that doesn't really have a site like this. He, you know, has some historic homes, but not in the same way that a lot of other presidents do. And so the time is, I think, long overdue for that and will be welcome to encourage more study because he did come at such an interesting point in American history and and represent so many different unique complicated interwoven ideas that it will be a really good opportunity and interestingly you you all may know that but our listeners may not that the statue that was formerly in the front of the new york museum of natural history that depicted roosevelt on horseback with a uh, native african and a native american beneath not beneath like laying underneath the horse but next to the horse but on on foot uh, was removed from the museum at at Roosevelt's heir's request and will be at that site as part of the museum collection. I wrote about um, Roosevelt and, and uh, statues. The family did not want statues of him particularly, especially his daughter Alice, and he didn't either. And he, when he was asked what would be a good monument to him, he said, well, the Roosevelt Dam in Arizona, that's about the right size. So, you know, <laughs> but public utility, but it, I mean, it has to do with public utility and the Newlands Reclamation Act, which he thought was one of his greatest achievements. You know, you mentioned his death. Just two things about that. His son, Archie, you know, Roosevelt died in his sleep on uh, uh, January 6th, 1919. He was just 60 years old. His uh, son, Archie, wrote to the others who were in France and said, the old lion is dead. But even better, the vice president of the United States issued a statement and said, it's good death came to him while he was sleeping. Otherwise, there would have been a fight. Isn't that cool? I love that's, it. That's such a great tribute. It's a great line for Roosevelt. And this was just the kind of man he was. Even his enemies, and he had a lot of them, couldn't quite dismiss him because there was something deeply admirable about him and boyish and, and, and the zest for life unique. I mean, it's, the word unique should almost never be used by historians, but I can't think of another president who belongs in that category, Lindsay, of uh, the kind of heroic outdoorsman willing to climb the Matterhorn on his honeymoon, nothing he won't try, give me that horse that no one's ever ridden, sure, I'll try it. I don't think there's anyone in our presidential history who had that kind of indomitable lust for life. And I think that it's so infectious that for all the reasons that you might want to criticize Roosevelt, and there are plenty, you can't ever not admire the kind of the super Americanism of him that's not the wrong kind of Americanism. It's not hiding behind the flag. It's more like America is a nation where we can do anything and we have the frontier and we have the best mountains and the great plains and the greatest rivers and I've been through them all. I've, that that Roosevelt 
is, I think, infectious. We've talked a lot about his character and things. that, To me, he's kind of like Jefferson in the sense that he accomplished many great things, but there was a dark side. And on the other hand, his legacy and, and what he left us, particularly in the area of conservation, is immense. So can we do that? Can we spend a little bit of time on some of the dark side of Roosevelt and then uh, move into his accomplishments? I'll quote one thing, and then I want Lindsay to do the commentary, if she will. Um, she quoted the best thing maybe he ever said, the man in the arena speech. Uh, here's, in my opinion, the worst. This is from his four-volume magnum opus, Winning of the West, and he's talking about the winning of the Ohio West, the early West, Washington's West, actually. And he says this, and I apologize in, for uh, reading it. The most ultimately righteous of all wars is a war with savages, though it is apt to be also the most terrible and inhuman. The rude, fierce settler, white settler he means, the rude, fierce settler who drives the savage from the land lays all civilized mankind under a debt to him. American and Indian, Boer and Zulu, Cossack and Tartar, uh, New Zealander and Maori. In each case, the victor, horrible though many of his deeds are, has laid deep the foundations for the future greatness of a mighty people. The consequences of struggles for territory between civilized nations seem small by comparison, etc., etc. So, you know, this is... He was a friend of Kipling. They both share the view of the white man's burden. They both believe that the Anglo-Saxon people are the class act of the world, the most productive, the most enlightened, the most mighty, the most deserving to civilize the rest of the world. And Roosevelt was unapologetic about these things. We are the beneficiaries, and we must accept our complicity in that. But we would never utter statements like that today, and they do besmirch an otherwise extraordinary intellectual writer and and leader. Um, so there's that. But, you know, I won't say he was a man of his times. So that's such a cop-out. But if you take the whole person theory, Lindsay, that has to be in there. But it can't dominate, right? No, I think that that's absolutely correct. It, so... He definitely believed in a racial hierarchy. He believed that certain people were better than others. He believed that the better people had a right, perhaps a duty, to conquer and subdue those that were less than. And that applied to both Native Americans, it applied to Puerto Ricans, it applied to Cubans, it applied to things like the... Filipinos. Uh, Filipinos. It applied to things like the Russo-Japanese War. He saw Japanese as gentlemen, as fellow gentlemen. So his racial categorizations were not necessarily just white and other. Um, he saw the Russians as barbarians and so actually sided with the Japanese, at least morally, uh, in, in that particular conflict. So it took on a global dimension as well. And I think his his militaristic approach to foreign policy, although he did help sort of avoid and end certain wars, but then was very much in favor of others, could be categorized as heartless or not fully comprehending the incredible loss of life that would accompany those positions. So there were real times that he was cavalier about wanting the U.S. to go to war and the sacrifices and tolls that that would take on American families until he lost his own son, and then he had a little bit of a change of heart about how quickly the U.S. should enter into other conflicts because he experienced that pain himself. So there are real weaknesses there, and they cannot be overlooked, and they shouldn't be dismissed, and they shouldn't be diminished. And I do, I do think that um, he was certainly not alone in those attitudes, but there were also people who pushed back on them. There were people who, like Jane Addams, who was much more of a pacifist and worried about the loss of life when the U.S. entered into World War I. And so I, I think that the whole picture needs to be told and needs to be understood. And, and I think that only makes him a more interesting person and a more interesting story. And I firmly believe that if we know the flaws and, and the bad actions of humans and humanity in general, it makes us better able to appreciate the greatness, because you can't have one without the other. But this larger-than-life persona that he had, uh, don't you think that sort of enabled him to achieve uh, so many of the things that he did achieve? And maybe we can move into that. You were talking about, you know, simple things like food inspection, 
and then and then conservation, the the vast amount of land that he preserved. Yeah, well, just a couple of things about that quickly. First of all, I want to mention the Brownsville incident, uh, which occurred on the Texas uh, border, uh, and uh, it's a long and complicated story. But Roosevelt overreacted as president and dishonorably discharged more than 140 African American soldiers. Uh, Richard Nixon undid that damage or tried to undo that damage uh, many, many decades later. It was one of the least admirable moments in Roosevelt's life because it it, it wasn't so much about race. It's, it was about stubbornness and righteousness, and he was definitely a righteous man. But I want to say this about his greatness. He was able to get away with a lot of the reforms that Lindsay's mentioned, food, and, food uh, regulations, um, uh, child labor laws. Um, uh, making sure the District of Columbia uh, was less segregated than other places in the country and so on. A lot of reforms that we associate with Roosevelt, and especially conservation, were made possible by the fact that, A, he was a huge and dominating and persuasive personality, but also he had two enormous um, advantages. He was a bona fide war hero from the, the war in Cuba, and whatever else you thought of him, that was the man who got on that horse and went up San Juan Hill on a kind of a suicide mission. And secondly, he was our first cowboy president, and he had that larger-than-life kind of persona that he developed in the West. And so people, he, he, had, he, he brought something to it that he would not have had if he had been a regular old Republican, New York-based political figure of the time. There was He was legendary in his own time in a way that McKinley wasn't and in a way that um, Coolidge wasn't, and, and et cetera. And so that that really helped him, Lindsay. Well, he was also an incredible innovator in terms of understanding the moment and the shifting technology. So he was one of the first presidents of the modern era who understood the press and understood what the press needed. And they needed stories all the time. So he held daily conferences with newspaper reporters, usually while he was having his afternoon shave, and he would answer their questions. And then they would have to ask, okay, well, was that answer on the record or off the record? And he, you know, didn't always give them the, the answers that they wanted. And they kind of, you know, got in on the game. So sometimes they would save their most outlandish questions until the barber was taking the straight edge razor right up under his jugular and then he would leap up in frustration and the barber would have to like quickly move his arm so he didn't decapitate the president but he he understood he developed a rapport he ensured that when big things happened they were around to to capture it on on photograph and then to have to be there to give the information and that is a real skill, knowing how to communicate the, with the American people through whatever means are available to you, whether it's FDR in the radio or Kennedy in the television or Obama and Trump with social media. I mean, these things matter. And he was really, really good at it. And that skill is often overlooked in sort of his exuberance, but it was incredibly thoughtful and intentional and in the way that he crafted the White House to be a working space. He created the first White House press room, David, and... Yeah, there's a famous story in which he said to a bunch of uh, newspapermen who were gathered around him, he said, here's the story I want you to print tomorrow, and here's the angry refutation I want you to print the next day. <laughs> so he seeded the story, and then he gave them his angry refutation. And he loved this because they knew they knew everybody knew this was a game, and nobody ever played it better than T.R. Well, one more thing about uh, Roosevelt and race, and, you know, it, it it's— to call people racist, I mean, it's hard to be a white male in America and not have a trace of that somewhere, even if we don't see it. But could could you tell the story of Minnie Cox? Because I think that's so fascinating. Yeah, so Minnie Cox was an African-American postmistress uh, in the South, and uh, Roosevelt was has a mixed record on these questions. He invited Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House the first time that had ever happened to black person at a formal dinner in the White House. But the the racists of of, of, of Tennessee, I think, refused to uh, allow Minnie Cox to be their postmistress. Uh, they just said they weren't going to deal with a, a black person. And Roosevelt said, fine. And he closed the post office um, and moved it like 20 miles and said, okay, now you, now you can go get your mail 20 miles away. But it was that's the story you wanted, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing, you know. He, so this is very it's, innovative. It's so American, don't you think? <laughs> well, it's so Roosevelt because you know it's 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 a very to use Lindsay's words, it's a very innovative answer to that question. So okay, you don't want a black postmistress? 
uh, get your mail any way you can. Look, at, we've got about, I, I have to tell the two of you we are out of time, but I, I wanted to leave at least a couple of minutes for uh, some sort of conclusion statement from the both of you. Oh my gosh, there's just so much that we haven't covered. Um, and I, it, sometimes I don't even know where to start, but I think that I would say, so my favorite story of Roosevelt, which is a, a small detail, but I think captures his exuberance, his fanaticism, his... Um, you know, flaws and greatness all in all at once. So he really had a pretty remarkable cabinet and worked pretty well with most of his cabinet members, with the exception of the various secretaries of Navy. He could not keep a secretary of Navy in office, and he had six while he was president, which is an extraordinary turnover in one office. And the reason that he could not keep a secretary of Navy in office was because he could not help himself but meddle in every single detail and every single decision. And he had a real love and passion for the Navy. He believed in its importance for the future of the United States. He was fascinated by technology and, and a military culture and all of these things. And at one point he even went so far as to dictate the length of spurs that the cavalry troops should be wearing. And his secretaries just couldn't take it. And so the rest of his cabinet did a really pretty good job working with him, except for the secretaries of the Navy. Yeah, that's a great story. You know, we should, we'll do a second program on this and then a third on Alice because there's, as you say, Lindsay, there's so much more to say and so much more that it's important. It's not just our colorful anecdotes, but, you know, it's very, very consequential president. We were the fifth largest Navy when he began, second by the time he ended. He really brought the American into the world arena, sometimes kicking and, and screaming. He changed the constitutional understanding of of the executive branch of government, et cetera, et cetera. But, but here's one that I just love. He really pushed the Panama Canal, one of his greatest achievements, and it was done in such a high-handed way that everybody but Roosevelt was embarrassed about what he had done, fomenting rebellion in the northern neck of Colombia and so on. So he was widely criticized for his high-handedness. So he called a cabinet meeting and gave about a two-hour monologue explaining and justifying what he had done. And finally, his attorney general, Philander Knox, interrupted him and said, look, Mr. President, it's a very great thing you have done, and I wouldn't cloud it with any hint of legality. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lindsay. We love you. Uh, come back. Uh, you've brought great joy and zest, uh, not to mention uh, brilliance, to what we do. We'll see you all next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.